the end of math, please wait for the ushers to dismiss you through the back doors of the church. We will now be contributing the Holy Eucharist in the entrance to the Father Philip Wells Hall for one hour after every weekend Mass. After we have watched our online Mass, we invite you to come and receive communion. There will be additional time for confessions on Wednesdays from 5.45 to 7 p.m. in the John Paul II room and in the entrance to the Father Philip Wells Hall. This will begin on February 24 and continue every Wednesday throughout Lent. Our first Saturday Mass will resume on March 6 at 9.30 a.m. Please sign up for Mass Online on our website. The church will be closed on Wednesdays during Lent from 1.30 to 3 p.m. Our worship aid to follow readings and the order of the Mass available on our parish app and on our website. You can access it on your phone or mobile device during Mass. Please sign into your devices as a sign of reverence for God and respect for one another. Lent is a dead end unto itself. We go into the desert with Jesus in order to advance holiness and in our spiritual life. All the blessings and trials in our life are not those events. They are precursors to more, greater trust in God, deeper union with Him, and a greater sense of our mission to proclaim the kingdom. Please stand now and welcome our fellow
will establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all bodily creatures be destroyed by the waters of a flood. There shall not be another flood to devastate the earth. God added, This is the sign that I am giving for all ages to come of the covenant between me and you and every living creature with you. I set my bow in the clouds to serve as a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow appears in the clouds, I will recall the covenant I have made between me and you and all living beings so that the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all mortal beings. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Your ways, O Lord, are love and truth to those who keep your covenant. Your, your ways, ways, O Lord, are love and truth to those who keep your covenant. Your ways, O Lord, make known to me. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my Savior. Your ways, O Lord, are love and truth to those who keep your covenant. Remember that your compassion and your love are from of old. In your kindness, remember me because of your goodness, O Lord. Your ways, O Lord, are love and truth to those who keep your covenant. Good and upright is the Lord. Thus he shows sinners the way. He guides the humble to justice, and he teaches the humble his way. Your ways, O Lord, are love and truth to those who keep your covenant. A reading from the first letter of St. Peter. Beloved, Christ suffered for his sins once, the righteous for the sake of the unrighteous, that he might be sweet to God. Put to death in the flesh, he was brought to life in the spirit. In it, he also went to preach to the spirits in prison, who had once been disobedient, while God patiently waited in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few persons, eight in all, were saved through water. This prefigured baptism, which saves you now. It is not a removal of dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. The word of the Lord. Lord. 
Again, the homily, just like to announce that this Sunday that we join all of our parishes and our diocese for the 2021 Annual Catholic Appeal. So the uh, Annual Catholic Appeal, most likely we've already uh, we've known uh, for obviously since the time that we've been here with the diocese. It's an annual giving that we do to our Catholic charities and that 25% of what we give to the diocese will come back to us for charitable works that we do here. And so um, the way that, well, normally the way it's done is a video is shown and then there's time that everyone fill out their envelope with the pews uh, because of uh, COVID that we're doing this a little differently this year. So the envelopes uh, will not be filled out in the pews. The video will not be shown. There's a video on our website that we invite everyone to watch. And also I think after the live stream mass this morning that the video was connected to the end of that mass. The envelopes, I believe, are in the vestibule. Just like to invite everyone to grab one before you leave. So this will be an ongoing um, uh, effort that we do. And we'll just, um, just try to be generous, obviously, not only because we're in Lent, but it's, it's you know, tremendous uh, need of our brothers and sisters. So the 25% uh, that came back last year was for our Good Samaritan Fund, and that these funds were used to provide rental assistance to parishioners, to pay for a parishioner's funeral, and to provide tuition assistance to students at St. Elizabeth and Seton School. So uh, this first Sunday of Lent, we see this uh, mysterious encounter of Jesus and the devil in the desert. And so it's important that I heard recently, I think it makes sense, there's a big picture and there's a small picture. The big picture is the uh, history of salvation. And if we don't understand the big picture, we can't make sense of our small picture. So what we want to do is just uh, kind of go back a little bit, connect the dots, so to speak, uh, you know, how, what's going on here, how is that connected to my life, and what do I need to do in order to be victorious. So, starting point is Jesus himself, the second person of the Holy Trinity, true God, true man, at the same time, comes to say for and decree for us men and women for our salvation. Uh, and so, Jesus comes uh, for two purposes, disciple. There's two things that Jesus does for us. Uh, one of them, it shows us example. And so he's our model. He's, uh, Jesus Christ shows man and woman to their selves. He shows us who we are, what we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to do, what we're supposed to avoid. And so we need to constantly look at him for example. And then Jesus uh, also merits for us being God, that's for that whole idea of God and man at the same time, that's the Redeemer that we needed. We couldn't save ourselves, God sent us His Son, who merits for us every grace that we need in our lives to follow Him, to be faithful to God. And so He teaches and then gives us real, actual grace and strength in order to do that in our own lives. So what we see in Him, we will also have that in us. And so. Uh, the mysteries of Christ, we say we use the term mystery because it's hard to understand. If you look at the gospel, you know, the, the previous scene as Jesus is baptized and you listen to the words of the Father, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then the next scene, Jesus by this move by the Spirit doesn't, you know, and inspired by the Spirit to receive temptation. And so, you know, obviously being God, no inclination to sin right there. You know, uh, he became almost, he became sin for us without having sin, we would say. And, uh, and so temptation, you say, well, okay, let's try to figure this one out. Because sometimes it appears that some of us don't even call things by their name. You say, I, I just, I don't know why I'm just perturbed by this. I'm thinking I get these strange thoughts, the strange inclination. Well, it's called a temptation, my friend. And you just have to call things out. You have to. That's why you have to look at the big picture. And so the temptation comes because we were born in original sin. And that happened because Eve and Adam ate from that. Ate from the tree, the forbidden tree. 
that we inherited this, and so baptism takes away sin, original sin, and the effects, but the, the concupiscence is what we, the church says, it, it's the tendency to sin. So in fomus peccato, so it's like uh, Poles, we would say, we would say it's like this, we have, a, we all have disordered tendencies within us, and as long as we keep them in check, we are okay. So therefore, you know, I can feel many things, but as long as I don't give in to them, they're not sinful. They're temptations that I actually overcome and I become stronger. So sin enters when I consent. And so that's also something that for us is helpful because sometimes we're not able to distinguish between what I feel and what I give into. And so the, the times in scripture give us a lesson about the psychology of the temptation, what it looks like. We see the psychology of the temptation in the book of Genesis. We see it also what happens with Jesus in the desert. And we see also that at, that, at the, this particular gospel, there's different, you know, the synoptic, uh, you know, evangelist. They, it's done in different ways, the three different temptations, but coincides in that the evil one left for a while. He, he wasn't done yet. He, he left for a while. And so we see him return, Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, and that, if you look at the movie Mel Gibson, The Passion, very interesting, you know, very imaginative, if you've seen, you know, Mel Gibson, his imagination, creativity, also based on scripture, you see that. And um, so, going to the first, the, the scene of Genesis, and it's important, just try to, to learn a few things here about what temptation looks like and, and you know, what not to do, turn to Jesus about what to do. And so what not to do is what happened with Eve and so that Eve enters into a conversation. You know, it's something so simple you think, okay, well, you know, where should it never start? And so that's the first thing in our lives in order to overcome temptation. There cannot be any dialogue going on. And so if something appears sinful for us, for us we should have a sixth sense, and we should immediately have some type of resistance, and, and, and we don't go there. And so because she started to dialogue, then what happens is, is that the evil one, being the fallen angel, intellectual being, right, superior than mankind in intelligence. So therefore, we cannot win on an intellectual way, and where we, we can be deceived many times. And that's so as scripture says that the, you know, the devil also can even appear as an angel of light. Very deceiving. Takes a lot of discernment. That's where that whole discernment of spirits comes in. Because we will have spirits acting within us. We have to discern. Is that impulse from God or is that impulse not from God? And so we see this as far as these fruits, right? Fruits of the Holy Spirit or fruits of the bad spirit, right? We have to, and a simple way to do this, okay, what is does this bring me peace, joy, tranquility, uh, you know, love, harmony, unity? Okay, Holy Spirit. Do I feel anxious, perturbed, nervous, worry, division, hate, anger, bad spirit? So what appears, and so this constant exercise, we have to be doing within us because Job says that life for us on, on earth is a warfare and it's true. But it's when we say if Christ is victorious or he won the battle, well, it means that there's, we're on the battlefield. So you can imagine if someone never lives their lives thinking that it's real, a real spiritual battle or warfare going on. There's, and so there's no, there's no moment of not fighting. There's no moment of saying it's done. Because St. Peter says that the devil goes around like a roaring lion constantly. No, does not sleep, does not take breaks, no vacations, looking for someone to devour. So he will, you know, especially be present when we're weak, even physically, I would even start there. And we've probably noticed that, having slept well, having to take care of ourselves, and I just get a lot of temptations recently, well, because I'm in a weak state, that's just physically. More importantly, it's the weak spiritual state. And so when we, when we pray, uh, we receive real strength from God to resist temptations. And so when we encourage 
you know, all of us to, to pray and that you can't not do it, and, and it's real life stuff. I mean, some people will say, oh, she's, you know, didn't pray my one-armed father before I went to bed. Like, Bang! Wrong answer. I don't know why that comes up. comes up a game show you and give the wrong answer. So, that, you know, at the very beginning, at the very beginning of the day, before we leave the house, we should already have prayed because there will be snares and traps set up for me along the way. Uh, and so, this is what we just need to understand what this looks like. So, Jesus, uh, in, when he suffered his passion, he said what gives us kind of like a program of life. There is something simple to under, at least in concept, simple to understand, but we should constantly be doing this. He says, watch and pray because the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. So that means there's, there's a dynamic going on within us is that we are inherently weak. Is that without God, we can't please Him. Without God, we can't fulfill the commandments. Therefore, there are graces that if we don't ask for, we don't receive. That's just that mystery of prayer. That's why it's never an option. It's something truly essential. So we pray as if everything depends on God, complete dependence on God and His help. But then this watching, what this means is this vigilance. And we could say it with this, another way to say it is calling things out, calling things by their name. So that's what the light of Christ does. It's like a flashlight, it's like a mag light. It's police mag light. It just goes out there and it's just constantly calling things out as they are. What do we go up up? go up against a secular world where there's no right and there's no wrong and everything's fine. And so if I'm constantly, you know, opening the window of my soul, not having hardly any prayer, not having contact with scripture, see how Jesus quoted scripture and was, had this deep knowledge of God's will, well, it's kind of a no-brainer that we're going to be duped and we're going to get deceived. And so the renewal of the baptismal promises that we do during the Easter vigil, it says that we make renouncements and then we, we say what we believe in. But in the renouncements, if, if we go back and look at it, you can Google that, what the renewal of the baptismal promises is, which we've all been baptized, and so constantly have to renew that. Lent is to go back to that completely, complete renewal. And so when we say, I renounce Satan, I renounce his works, I renounce sin. And another thing that we say there is that I renounce his seductions. So you look at even that term seduction, immediately think of some, you know, bad movie on Netflix or something. So I don't know, that's true, you watch a lot of Netflix. So seduced, he was seduced, he seduced her, she just seduced him, whatever. Well, that word seduction means it's kind of gradual. That's where, and even if you look at, you know, different types of sin, what happens is, is there's a near occasion of sin. This is some, another important aspect here. Each of us have a particular weakness, you know, and so we need to know ourselves. We need to learn from our faults because every one of them has a beginning. And so if we're truly sorry for sin, if we're truly repentant, we cannot go back to how that starts. Now that sin can start with a group of people, places, things, you know, even if you were to look at it from this perspective of like, you know, dating, you know, I'm just going to talk about many types of sins. Let's just say the sin against purity. Let's just throw that one. And you say, you know what? So we are really struggling here. Self and my girlfriend, we are just struggling so much. Well, then stay out of that dark room with your door closed and whatever. You know, so it's like you have to learn, you know, do not go near. Anyone can play with fire, you are going to get burned. And there's, and so, God's grace is the strongest at the beginning. If we resist at the beginning, we receive his help, we're victorious, but once the dialogue starts, it's just this slippery slope down, and basically would say it's just a sin, that to play with sin, we would call it a sin because that's where it's gonna end up. There's really, you, you won't have God's help after that and you've just been deceived. And so that's what sin does for us. That's going back to the book of Genesis. It appears as the apple. And, you know, pleasing to the eye. This is another important lesson for us regarding, because it's all connected here, is that the devil's never going to present something as ugly. Never, ever. 
never going to present something as ugly, never going to present something that is going to cause me hardship or, you know, it's going to lose, make me lose my peace or lose my friendship with God. Always going to present to me something that's going to give me whatever I'm looking for. And, and, and actually, it could even do that. That's what the sin could do. I could have it, and then it's gone. And then I realized because I was duped, I lost my friendship with God. And so that's the psychology of sin. It works in all of us, and that's, just, that's why we have to learn how it works. And then we have Mary, who uh, you know, we should call upon many times during the day. It's interesting about the different sins. I heard one about, I mean, going back to the sin against purity, is that you know, St. Francis is even tempted. You know, I have an image of St. Francis in my backyard over there. And um, you know, it's not just for squirts. I mean, he was severely tempted one day. And uh, so what did he do? Throw, throw himself in some rose bushes. So I, I wouldn't uh, you know, recommend doing that, but it shows you how much that, you know, the sins. St. Thomas of Point, that's another one. I, there's a story about that another time, about sin against purity, and that you know, that St. Thomas's uh, parents didn't want him to be, you know, a chaste monk and a priest. So, you know, put some woman in a cell right there, you know, and um, chased her off with a sword. And so, I mean, you know, get away from me. I'd rather, I'd rather die than sin. It's a, a whole thing about, it's very, and I think that's where we really need to pay attention today. It seems like there's no resistance. It seems like, you know, it, I, I don't know, I have the sense that for many people there's just no fight. There's no resistance. It, the lives of the saints teach us is, it's always even better to die than to sin. Let's stand for the creed. I believe in one God, God, the Father, Father Almighty, maker, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things remain, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Approaching the throne of our Heavenly Father, let us offer our prayers for the church and the world. For the church, may the Lord guide and protect her in proclaiming the kingdom of God to all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who serve in state and local governments, may the Holy Spirit inspire them in working to protect the most vulnerable, especially the unborn. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who depend on our generosity, through the annual Catholic appeal, those who need assistance, and all those who work tirelessly in the charitable organizations and parents of rich ministries that serve them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For our great community, as we enter into this season of repentance and renewal, that God may bring our hearts to a pure belief in the gospel. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the birthday intentions of Sunny and Rikas, may our loving Father continue to abundantly bless and protect them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the faithful departed, especially the Vinador Molina, Lorisita Molina, 
Larissa Polina, Salome Pauline, and for all whose death was caused by the coronavirus, may they soon rejoice with all the angels and saints in heaven. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for those who have recently died in their parish family, namely Henry Rodeo, Jaime Valeriano, and Alfredo Visitacion, may they know God's perfect peace in the heavenly kingdom. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for all the prayers that we hold in the silence of our heart, for all our intentions, spoken and unspoken. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, yeah. Loving God, trusting in your saving power, we offer these prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 